Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Debbie Young. Hi Debbie! Hello! <laughs> Great to have you on the show. So just a little introduction. Debbie writes short stories and flash fiction as well as non-fiction on various topics. She's also the commissioning editor for selfpublishingadvice.org, the blog for the Alliance of Independent Authors, and she's also the co-author of Opening Up to Indie Authors, a guide for bookstores, libraries, reviews, literary event organisers, and self-publishing authors. It's a of a title but we're talking about <laughs> it today <laughs> so Debbie just um just start by telling us a bit more about you and your writing journey and uh, how you became an indie uh, right okay well it took me a very long time really to get around to it because I'd, I'd always wanted to write books from when I was little when I was very little and it was just something I always enjoyed writing stories and um when I went to uh, university to do an English degree because that seemed the obvious next step to do. Wasn't quite sure where to go after that but thought about journalism and um, my first proper job really was in journalism and sort of fell into a career of different kinds of jobs that all involved writing um, in some form or other for marketing, promotion, um, communication, sort of spreading information um, for first of all as a journalist, then as a PR consultant, and then latterly in a children's reading charity. So everything always seemed to lead back to the written word for me. Mm. And um, it was really only when I was working for the children's reading charity that purely by chance I, um, came, I met the wife of somebody who I used to work with years ago when I was in PR consultancy, and she'd set up a, a self-publishing services company. Uh, and that was uh, Helen Hart of Silverwood Books, who offers all kinds of services to help authors who don't want to go the total DIY, DIY route to publish beautiful professional standard books. Got chatting to her about it. Um, by that time, I'd started blogging. Uh, I really enjoyed blogging because it's a way of writing what I wanted to write rather than writing, you know, commercial newsletters or magazine articles or whatever. Really enjoyed that. And uh, got chatting to her about it. And she was telling me about the problems that her authors faced uh, when they produced this beautiful book, that how challenging it was for the authors to go, at, and this was a few years ago, um, how challenging it was to find readers for their books and how she wanted to give as much help and encouragement to her authors as possible to promote their books. And uh, the upshot of it was that I said, well, what you really want is, you know, you're a publisher, you need to publish a book about uh, book promotion. And... She said, well, would you like to write it? <laughs> so <laughs> walked into that one. So then I wrote a book called Sell Your Books, which was drawing on my sort of PR and communication experience, really, to help her authors particularly to um, market their self-published books. Researching that, I've learned so much about the way that self-publishing was going. I mean, I, I had encounters with people who had gone through the old-fashioned vanity publishing route in the past um, and dismissed that. Never quite had the patience or the time, really, to pursue writing the books that I'd always wanted to write um, and to go the traditional route. But when I heard about the self-publishing route, I thought, my goodness, how lucky are we to be born at this time when we have this at our disposal? You know, it's, it's such a, 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 a godsend, really. Such a wonderful thing to be able to be involved with. Um, found out that about the Alliance of Ind Independent Authors that Orna Ross was just founding, as you well know, and started to become involved with them. Not long afterwards, I was invited by Orna to get involved with running the advice blog. I'd written some guest posts on various topics there and really was enjoying being part of the community and enjoying the buzz and the companionship that came out of that and, and finding it was such a great way to learn all about it. Um, and, and and as well as uh, having latched onto your your website and your and all, all that you were doing, you could see that that you know the people like like yourself really leading leading everybody um, along in in the whole sector. And I just really wanted to be part of it. And really, it's started to take over my whole life now. <laughs> yes, it, does, it tends to do that. But it's um, addictive. Yes. Yeah, it does. It does. 
Yes, yeah, so you've definitely jumped in and, and it is a really fun community. And and why I wanted to talk to you about this book is it's a brilliant resource for authors. And I would say the second half is aimed at authors. Uh, the first half is really aimed at that sort of uh, getting events and book book um, bookstores and things to open up to indie authors. But the second yes. half is all about how authors can get into bookstores and libraries and stuff. So First up, uh, why did you and Dan Holloway write the book and why do you think the opening up to indie authors sort of idea is so important? Well, it was becoming very apparent from the various conversations online, partly on the Ally Forum and in responses to other blogs and all, all the various activity online, that there are an awful lot of people who didn't have who had a lot of misconceptions about the way that self-publishing works, about the standards that are applied, the way it operates, um, and, and people on both sides of the fence. Authors were, were had a lot of misconceptions, misperceptions about how the trade viewed them, um, and the trade had and still does have a lot of misunderstandings about how self-publishing works and how and the, and the standards, the quality standards particularly, um, that uh, the best self-published authors are able to achieve. And having, I think particularly because I had a background in communications and in public relations and building relationships between different parties, it was very clear that somebody really needed to get in there and bring the two together, sort of almost like being the, the diplomat, you know, bringing together, not quite warring factions, but but making people understand each other better. And once they understood each other better, then they would be able to work together more effectively. And the, the, the Orla had wanted to produce a book like this for some time. And I think I happened to be in the right time at the right place with the right background to mm. be able to to do that and to and all of these things need to be phrased very diplomatically as well so as to avoid offending or upsetting or making making the situation worse rather than better you know that I'm, I'm, I'm a quite good diplomat that was the other thing that I would have wanted to do when I was younger was to go into the diplomatic service yeah <laughs> well, and you know it's really funny you say that because I was uh you know last year the year before I was speaking at a lot of publishing conferences and and I also really wanted to be a kind of diplomatic go-between mm -hmm. and then something happened and I just went I I put my hands up and I give up because the, I you just can't I well I found that you however much we talk about like you mentioned quality standards we mention you know independent authors as opposed to self-publishing which to me you know independent author kind of implies the professionalism and mm. and I just got to the end of my tether of defending us you know in a way and just kind of wanted to just get on with what we do and it's almost you know when people are uh, religious and the best way yeah. of showing your faith is by your behavior not by preaching about yes. it I almost yeah. I got to that point and then your yeah. book which I think is perfect and diplomatic and wonderful and should be uh, more widely read by people in the industry but um yeah anyway I'm I'm I think what I'm saying is thank you for writing it <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to do it. Somebody had to do it. And I also think it's very useful for authors who want to stay you know continue approaching these kind of groups to you know it helps uh, understand their language so I do I know I do kind of want to ask about that because you did mention there you said um, the quality standards that the best self-publishers can achieve um, and you have a number of exhortations in the book you know what standards are you asking in these to have when they approach libraries bookstores etc well, the most important thing is they have a book that looks like a professional book that lead, that reads like a, a, a trade published book in the best possible way. So that I always say that if you have an identity parade of books from that are taken off the, the shelf of a library or in a, in a bookshop, you don't want to be able to spot the self-published one. And if yours is obviously self-published, you know, homemade Blue Peter job type approach, then then you're doing something wrong. So first and foremost, you've got to have a product that will fit in with in, in that professional environment because bookshops, libraries, festivals, all of these players, they have the highest standards. They're trying to they're trying to serve their audiences with the best possible goods. So you've got to have, you've got to do all that you can to make your book the best it can possibly be. Um, 
you've also got to leave behind you any sense of entitlement. Mm. You've got to be prepared to take your place in the marketplace, effectively being making a bid for the space on the shelf or in the festival program or on the library in the library shelf um, alongside the rest of the players. You may feel fantastic that you've written a book and quite rightly so because there are so many people out there who always say, oh, I've got a book in them, but never actually, never actually do it. And yes, it is a wonderful thing to have been able to write your book and to get it out there, but you have no entitlement to expect people to read it, to buy it, to borrow it, to want to talk about it, unless you've given it your all. Um, And when you go into... Um, deal with any of these players, with any of the the book buyers, um, festival organisers or whatever, you've got to recognise that they are um, getting great approaches from people who are as good as if, if not better than you all of the time. And you've got to really have something, you've got to have your case, make your case very well and be prepared to have to make your case. Um, I hear, speaking to uh, booksellers to owners of bookshops who are simply there trying to make their living out of selling books. You, I hear of so many cases where authors have taken their book into the shop in the middle of a busy Saturday, almost expected, expecting the proprietor to, to snap up copies on the spot to put on their shelves, um, having no grasp of what they're really asking the bookseller to do, not really understanding how um, they operate, um, how much administration they have to do, how difficult it is for them to deal with a one-off supplier, um, and not understanding that the bookseller has to make money out of their book. Um, there are even authors who go in being bit, who are quite surprised to find that the bookseller wants a cut of the price at all. And you thought, well, what planet have these people been living on? <laughs> Should well, they be allowed out um, alone? Let, yeah. Let's talk a bit more about that because the reality, I mean, the reality of a bookstore, I think is something I'm always surprised that most authors don't actually realise what the reality of a bookstore is. So maybe you can just talk about um, returns, the turn, you know, how fast the turnover is and that discounting element. Yes, okay. Um, Typical booksellers will expect around 40% discount off your list price, off your recommended retail price. So that's an enormous chunk off off your bottom line, really. Why do they expect that? Well, they they have their own costs to pay. They have staff costs. They have their um, their rent, their rates, um, or whatever it's costing them to run their shop. How they are paying for the running of the shop is from the sales of books and that has to come from somewhere um you know they're not there as charities so people don't don't really think about the economics of how much it would cost if you know to to put the boot on the other foot if an author wanted to try and do sort of the economic sums of how much it would cost them to set up and run a bookshop they would soon become quite incredulous as to how anyone ever makes profits out of running a bookshop at all and how do, how do so many bookshops stay open I mean I know we're we're losing a shocking number of independent bookshops um all the time I mean it's just a, a, a shrinking a shrinking marketplace um quite honestly I'm surprised that there are still so many shops trading and that's another one another campaign that we're going to be looking at this year perhaps come on to that a bit later is we want to try and encourage authors and try to encourage everybody to use bookshops high street bookshops so much more so that we can help them continue to sell books of all kinds not just self-published books but just to keep them on our streets and keeping our culture thriving really sorry i digress completely there um but yes yeah, so they're looking for 40 percent discount um they are looking for ease of administration if you're supplying a bookshop with just your book and nobody else's book, for all the books that you, they sell for you, there's going to be paperwork involved. Now, I, I'm very, very lucky. I live very close to three independent bookshops. And talking to the proprietor of two of them, Heriwood Corbett, Yellow Lighted Bookshop in Tetbury and Nailsworth in Gloucestershire, um, I went in to see him one day when I was researching for this book and he said, oh, um, you caught me at a good moment. You know, it's quiet here. I've just had somebody coming in to pitch to me today from one of the big publishing companies with the hundred books that are most likely to be the bestsellers within that publisher's um, list for the next six months. Um, 
10 seconds of book, fully up to speed. I'll get one invoice for all of those. Mm. How, how good is that? And you think, gosh, yes, you know, that, that is so much simpler than dealing with 100 authors individually, mm. uh, which would just be a diabolical a nightmare administratively to have to deal with them all in, individually. So not only have you got to make your case to the bookseller for your book being good and saleable, but you've got to make it worth his while to go the extra mile and do that extra admin around your book to sell your book. Mm. Um, and then suppose if you've got your book selling for, um, say, £10, uh, which is quite expensive for paperback, um, and he's only getting £4 per copy, effectively, use those numbers because they're nice and simple to calculate with, then all he's getting for doing all the paperwork surrounding your book and giving you your cheque or your cash or, or um, backs payment or whatever, um, for finding it space on the shelf, keeping it on the shelf, keeping an eye on it, um, remembering to pay you at the right time and all, or, or taking it out off the shelf when it's been on there long enough and he doesn't think it's sell to let you know that you need to collect it because it's on sale or return. Well, all of that for four pounds is an awful lot of work per book. And that's if he sells any at all. Yeah. Um, most booksellers will only take a couple of copies. If the, if they take 10 copies from you, you are doing very well indeed. And um, if they are replicating that, that sort of activity for every book on the shelf. That's an awful lot of work. Um, they have to operate on the basis of sale or return because if they don't sell your book, then what are they going to do with it? You know, they can't, they run on such tight margins and on such tight budgets that they can't afford to buy books that they're not sure of selling. And in, um, other business, like with newspaper retailing, magazine retailing, it operates on the same basis. A shop will order in the newspapers and magazines. If they don't sell however many copies of the Times that day, then the Times will take take it back the next day and, and credit them for it. It has to work in the same way for bookshops, or else even more bookshops will be going out of business. Um, the trouble with sale or return is that if books are returned to you unsold, they're not going to be in as pristine condition as when you as when you took them in there. So you may not be able to resell them either. So if you are going to sell into um, physical bookshops, you have to really be committed to either accepting that you're going to collect them in a slightly, well, not necessarily battered condition, but in a not quite as good condition as you took them in. Um, and you say collect there, assuming that people are physically collecting books. Yes. Um, otherwise, you actually have to pay the shipping if you use a distributor. Yes. So you can already be out of pocket, even for yeah. just returns. Yeah, I mean, even if you happen to live in a flat over a bookshop, you know, it's still... Yeah, that's, well, then that's and it's also your it's, time. This is the Yeah, thing. exactly, your, yes. Your time yes. involved. But can we just also stress the um, the fast turnover of books in general? How long does a book normally stay in a, in a bookstore before the next lot of stuff comes in? Oh, they have books coming in all the time. So um, it's like a month, and, isn't it? A month, six yeah. months? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so even and they'll be. If you be... have a traditional publishing deal, your book will be in and out of the bookstore generally, unless it's a uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, will be in and out, you know, within a month to six weeks. Yes, yes, because there'll be lots more books coming along to take its place, and lots more that are more current, that's being more talked about, um, that will be the subject of the next film that's big in the cinema, and, mm. and there are always more coming to take, take their place. Um, and you have to. For a lot of for a lot of self published authors, the game isn't really worth a candle. Yeah, well, that's the funny <laughs> thing. We're talking. I don't have print as a business model myself. Mm -hmm. I use print on demand. But uh, after a massive mistake I made, you know, years ago when I bought two thousand books and then you know ended up putting them all in the landfill, um, you know, that I decided not to go that route. But um, I know some people do have that dream. So, what are the options for people who do want? to do the physical bookstore thing? Well, you can, if you're publishing through um, Ingram Spark or Lightning Source, you can um, include, you can tick the box when you're putting your book up there to accept sale or return, in which case you are then saying, you're, you're taking a punt on it basically, you're saying that you are prepared to fund the cost of the shipping and to accept the, the books returned. Um, and that is quite a big that is a big risk. But at the same time, while you're put, while you're making your books available through those channels to um, 
the booksellers, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to order them because whereas the big publishers will be having reps going around to all the shops, um, pitching, they're making a case for those books all the time. Uh, the only way really that a, a bookseller is likely to order in your book through that route is if they've seen something online or in the media, um, which will prompt them to uh, order in stocks of your book, or if they are local shops that you've built up a relationship with. So if you if you live close to books to bookshops and you go into those bookshops a lot, you're a good customer and you build up a good relationship with the staff, then there is the, the possibility that you will persuade them to take your books. And that's fantastic if you do, terrific. Um, in which case they can order them in that route. Or if you're going in there as a customer anyway, then why not just plan it so you take your books in, take your stocks in when you're going in to do your usual shop or going in and um, looking as if you're doing book shopping, even if you don't go in and buy books all the time. Because that's, that's the other risk. You know, if you, if you decide that every time that you're going to deal with local bookshops and do your deliveries by hand and do the little tour in your car every so often to take your books around, it's awfully tempting to go in and spend all your potential profits buying, <laughs> <laughs> buying your, books. Your £4 <laughs> profit. <you'd buy>. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I must admit I'm guilty of that. <laughs> well, I think, and this, you know, I think this is the interesting point um i mean we must say that the the biggest indies like um uh, barbara freethy bella andre hugh howie do have print deals and barbara freethy's is now with ingram spark who are distributing her books but she is you know the the the, the biggest indie author mm. and in romance as well so i mean maybe we're seeing a change uh in you know in people doing this but certainly it doesn't stop people doing print on demand um as you know default everyone should be doing print on demand as a default position yes yeah it's just, uh, yes uh, yeah that just the print run in a bookstore thing that you know may be more questionable yeah i th i think it's it's always good to have well, even if you're not going to go into bookstores at all it's still worth having some printed copies through print on demand or through short print run or however because, I mean, received wisdom is that you sell more books, more ebooks, if you've got the physical book mm. to show people, because it, it gives you a bit of credibility. People think, oh, so, so she's a real author. She's got a print copy. Mm. <laughs> and, and it's and great that for can... marketing. So, yeah. Yeah, oh, gosh, yes. And, and there are lots of other opportunities where a physical book will come and use um, at um, fairs and festivals or just going to author events, you know, to have a few print copies in your bag. Mm. Although there are all sorts of whizzy ways to making people... Um, making it easy for people to order your ebooks, so giving them a Q code on your business card or, or whatever, or giving giving them a book that they can buy on a memory stick or whatever. It, it's still really nice to be able to show the physical book. Hmm. Um, no, definitely. So, what about libraries? Because I'm I'm actually more interested in libraries. First of all, because you can get into Overdrive through Smashwords, so you know you can get ebooks into libraries, and also mm. libraries are moving digital. Um, yes. Yeah, which is interesting, and and I know of a start up by some indies who were going direct to libraries going to be putting you know ebooks directly into libraries so wh what about um indie authors getting into libraries i think it's a similar situation in a way to the bookshops in that you still have to convince them that your book is worth giving their shelf space to and that you, they should would do better to have your book there than somebody else's book um although librarians don't have the same responsibilities financially in a way, although they don't feel them as directly as a bookstore proprietor will because they're not worrying about whether they'll have enough income to pay their mortgage from, from, from the book sales. They still have a huge sense of responsibility for, for keeping the, the shelf space um, at its most appealing to keep luring in the punters because if they don't have people, members of the public coming in to use their library, then they won't have a library for very long. So they have their first duty really is to their key borrowers to keep the um, shelves looking good and to have an alluring stock in there. Um, so different libraries all over the world will have different ways of, of organising their buying. And the best thing really to do is to make inquiries at the local level to find out what your local libraries are doing. Um, and I think as with all marketing, really, you know, if you start off local and build up your confidence and awareness locally, then you can roll out what worked. You can find out what, what um, 
about your particular books excites people, excites bookshops and librarians, and then roll it out, you know, fine tune a, a larger um, campaign to roll out further afield. Um, I think libraries are also quite um, misunderstood by a lot of authors in the same in the same way as bookshops are people don't realize that in the same way that different bookshops will have different clientele and different bestsellers and different product ranges different libraries will do as well and and it's also easy to forget that just because you don't go into specialist libraries there are lots of specialist libraries that might be relevant to your books so academic libraries school libraries professional libraries you know they're not all the same um and um, so it's worth really drilling down and finding, just looking for opportunities that are particularly good for your kinds of books. Um, and I think also people need, authors ought to spend more time in libraries. I think I'm always astonished at how many authors I speak to who never really set foot in a bookshop and equally never set foot in a library. And then they wonder why they have trouble um, making themselves understood, you know, getting on the same wavelengths as booksellers and libraries, well, they've got to go in there just to sort of acclimatise and, and, and get to understand, um, just feel how their little world works. Um, and so much of it is down to really building communication and mutual understanding. Um, go, going back to bookshops for a second, um, I'm always horrified to hear tales from booksellers about uh, people going into bookshops and asking them for information, making all their inquiries, getting recommendations for books. And then when the bookseller says, well, okay, is this the book that you'd like to buy? They say, oh, no, I'll get it on Amazon. It's all right, don't worry. And and um, I think the same happens with, with libraries. You know, people don't don't really connect as they need or to need to do to get the best out of the relationship. Um, so I'm hoping that, the, that, the, that our book will help just, will give that little bit of a wake-up call to them in, in both spheres, really. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think, uh, you know, like you say, you have to think about the demographics and who is the market for your book. Mm. So each author has to consider what they want to do with their time. So I know, for example, yes. Karen Inglis, who, who, who's who been on the show, who is a children's book mm. author. People who write children's books in particular, I think, do have to be looking at schools and bookstores and, mm. and libraries mm. because that's a great way to reach children and, and their mm. parents. Whereas if you're writing um, more regular genre fiction like myself and your business model is not around that, mm. then you have to make that decision um, for yourself. So I think, but let's talk about organisations because I'm really interested. We've just uh, heard that the SFWA, the Science Fiction Writers mm. of America, is now opened up to indie authors. And uh, the organisation I'm in, the ITW, International Thriller Writers, is open. And so is RWA, Romance Writers America. A lot of these are American organisations, you notice, um, whereas mm. some of our <laughs> British ones still are not, um, which I think is, is classic snobbery. But what, what do you, I mean, it really is, it's brilliantly British. Um, what do you think about the professional organisations? How can indies, um, you know, it, help these organisations let us in as such? Um, again, it's, it's a question of proving themselves, proving themselves to, and their books to be of equal worth to those of their traditional sort of core members, um, which more and more indie authors are able to do because the standards are rising all the time. But they, but again, they don't. They have to make sure that they don't have a sense of entitlement and that they don't um, develop a victim mentality, which which some of them do. Uh, it's too easy for somebody to um, go into a little sort of self destructive spiral, saying, "Oh, well, they won't let me in because I'm an indie author and because I'm self published, and they're just being snobbish." Without actually really examining their book, and you know, a lot, some of them, but if they examine their book, they will realise that actually, you know, they, they don't stack up. So they've got to make sure that their books are of admissible calibre. It's not because that's actually what what why these these organisations have been slow to embrace self published authors. It's because they're trying to maintain maintain the calibres the calibre of the books that they're all about. It's not a personal thing. It isn't. It isn't really um, discriminatory against the people, it's against the, the product at the end of the day. Mm. Um, I think that from the organisation, organisations that I've um, 
been involved with, and I don't have the same degree of involvement that you have, um, because I haven't written as many uh, genre books as you have. I'm, I'm a bit na- a sort of narrow niche with my short stories and flash fiction, you know. But but uh, last year I went to, I was asked to go and speak to the Romantic Novelist Association in, um, or was it Shropshire, I think, somewhere. A very nice little sort of place that they, they were meeting. It's a, a, one of the um, agricultural universities, and it was just lovely. Uh, and I was, I was half expecting to have, you know, tomatoes thrown and things going on to, to talk about self-publishing because I'd heard that they were not that welcoming of it. But actually, talking to them, there, there was, I was really taken aback. They did, a lot of the authors that I spoke to, they really got it. They understood what it was all about. A lot of them had, a lot of the trade-published authors who had had great success in, in this very high-selling genre, um, had been through the standard um, process with trade publishers in having their less popular books and their older books being delisted, um, taken out of print, and they were finding that once they got their rights back, they could self-publish them and do very nicely out of them. And by trying to match them to the standards of their trade-published books, you know, to, to the reader, they didn't know or care who was publishing them. They were just keen to get hold of books written by their much-loved authors, and the these authors were finding that not only were these books going down well, but they were also making um, more money out of them per copy than of their latest bestseller, mm. which was which was very interesting. So in a way, those organisations are slightly sort of reforming themselves from within because the, the authors as individuals are having that experience. And um, the authors themselves seem to be very open-minded about it and were quite happy to entertain the idea. Um but like like everybody, you know, they'd, they'd also all seen lots of examples of very badly self-published books that they didn't want to that made them wary of of the of um, accepting them all mm. together, sort of yeah. as a lump. And and I guess that's as it should be, really. Yeah, and no, I agree. And I think these organisations do have a line. Uh, certainly, ITW yeah. can kind of prove your sales numbers, which is hilarious because if you are traditionally published, you don't have to prove any sales at all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you just prove that you've yes. got a book published, which is, as we yeah. know, a very different thing. Yeah. Um, but it, it, but also, it's interesting you say that because I this is the second year I'm um, judging a um, well, I picked a panel for Bristol Crime Fest, oh. uh, which you know I know you know about, and uh, so a lot of um, people submitted for the panel, and so I for two years now I've I've had a look at all these people who've submitted and been able to see the dramatic increase in quality. Um, in in just a year I mean the first year it was you know I found it quite difficult um but the second year it was I it was a real struggle to pick people because the quality was so high across the board so I think this quality kind of mission is getting out there um as people are realizing And, and and while you were talking I was also thinking that what what you're basically saying about libraries bookstores organizations is putting the author has to put their mind in in the mind of the recipient. There's a like classic yes. marketing. You have yeah. to think like a bookseller. What is yes. easiest for the bookseller? Or yes. think like the organisation. So you have to switch your head around and stop yeah, thinking absolutely. about me, the author, and think about yes. them. Yeah. Yes, yes. The more the more they can do that. Um, the easier they will find it, I'm sure. Yeah, I think it, and uh, I was also laughing because uh, I I've accepted uh, to speak at the Stratford Literary Festival, which, as you know, the home of Shakespeare. I'm fully <laughs> expecting this to be the final bastion of <laughs> of tomato throwing at indie. So, so I'm uh, that'll be interesting. That's later this year, and I think if if Stratford um, Literary Festival has opened up to indies we possibly won the open up campaign yes <laughs> splendid which is cool doesn't so, get better than that yeah so i also wanted to ask you about um the alliance and um you know what are some of the benefits that uh, you get from the organization and that you that you see coming you know um and and you know particularly around this book i know there's some things we're doing with this book as well as other things um, the alliance is lots and lots of benefits. I would say the the biggest single one that everybody would find in there who joined it is the companionship and the moral support and the feeling that they're not alone in their quest. Um, 
and it's a very it's a very warm supportive environment i mean not not all of our members are on the facebook forum but the facebook forum which has um oh, about 700 people engaged with it now um all over the world um i i think that just being part of that forum alone uh, justifies the membership because there are it's so whatever question or problem that you have with your book or even if you're just feeling a little bit discouraged you can go on that forum any time of day or night and there will be some indie author somewhere in the world who is on there <laughs> and, and you can put your question or, or, or um, share a, a view and uh, do surveys poll people about whether they like your book cover or your blurb or whatever and you will always get you will always get um, passionate but honest and kind responses, you know, that the people will be, there are um, different degrees of frankness with which people yes, will some tough love, love some tough love too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um, but it's, everybody has the same basic um, ideals, really. Everybody wants each other to succeed and for the sector to succeed. And, and that's, very helpful for anybody who's going through what is still a challenging um, process. Um, so that that's sort of more more a kind of um, emotional benefit in a way. But there are lots and lots of practical benefits. Um, you get discounts for all sorts of uh, services um, and events. You can get free ebook copies of the guidebooks that we offer. Um, you. There is an affiliate marketing scheme, which whereby if you have your membership logo on your membership badge on your website or on your email footer or whoever, and somebody clicks through there and becomes a member through your um, affiliate code, then you earn a very, what seems to me to be a very generous um, affiliate fee, a minor benefit compared to the advantages of the companionship, sharing best practice, meeting lots of new friends, bonding with people who are writing in your in the same genre as you are sometimes you can feel very isolated I and mean, we've just had a really interesting uh, contribution to the blog this week by somebody who is writing magical realism and suddenly there's a whole cluster of people saying oh yes I write that too and do you know about this person and, and it's lovely but it's just really embracing you know you, you do feel part of a huge community but it also is because we have um, lots of professional high achieving advisors like yourself who, who are contributing to the level of knowledge and the, the standards of practice within the group it's we're trailblazing best practice and showing people really how it should be done um, and so you feel as part of the group you feel like you are at the cutting edge and you there is just so much you can learn from the more experienced members even if you if you, even if you join it as somebody who is still writing the book and you can do that you can join it as an associate member um there are, you can just absorb knowledge almost by osmosis you know there's just so much <laughs> knowledge on there <laughs> you just and, and hang there's around a, and you absorb it there's a number of uh, free ebooks once you're inside the members thing we've got well, i think yes. the thing now we're saying is we can ask ally any question you like yes. about being an indie author and yes. there will be something that will answer your question or someone so and we have a monthly q a me and orna do that yes and, and hang yes. Out, google hangouts um we just had one last was it last night on the vat uh vat moss yes huge yeah. issue huge yeah, issue which so nobody we, wants to fight that one alone <laughs> yeah exactly so uh, i mean we trying to educate as well as have the community um side of things so i agree with you it's brilliant so um tell us what you know what is happening with the book in terms of uh you know breaking it into smaller pieces yes well we're going to um divide because at the moment we, we it's available free of charge to members um non-members can buy it for a very reasonable charge through the usual sources um but we're going to split it down into individual chapters and then build it build up each chapter into a sort of a mini ebook like a kindle single type book which will also have specific added sort of bonus features so with the um little book on how to get into booksellers into bookstores there will be things like how a, a template for producing a book information sheet um and sort of bits and pieces there'll be more material that we've assembled since the book was written um the latest blog posts links to the latest blog posts that will expand on the information that's in there so they'll they'll be because the the book 
has a number of different chapters about very specific niches, people will be able to pick and choose which piece they want according to what their current goal is. So if somebody is having a campaign, you know, if they feel that they've got um, bookstores and libraries sorted, but they really want to home in on getting places, speaking at literary festivals, and they can just um, buy the bit with the literary festival information and with lots more. So it's sort of like a, a, an expanded version of each chapter will then be a mini book. And that will also have obvious um, advantages in making it more discoverable for anybody outside of the organisation who hasn't got involved with Ally or hasn't, hasn't heard mm. of Ally um, yet, then they will still be able to find it through search engine. Mm, yeah, uh, I think it's a, it's like a brain trust, you guys, and 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 what's so great? <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it is, and what I find so brilliant is I totally admit to you not being particularly even interested in print books, you know, with bookstores mm. and libraries and stuff. That's not mm. what what my interest is. Mm. But then there's people like yourself and Piers and Karen and you know Orna and people who are doing this and are experts in in different areas. So it's kind yeah. of brilliant that there are people who are doing all kinds of different things. So whatever you're interested in, there will be other people who want to do that too. And and people who are writing all kinds of books. I mean, some really diverse um, genres. And, and I also just wanted to make sure people understand you and I are British, but this is an international organisation. So I, d I don't know if you know, I mean, how many countries um, we have members in. Uh, do you know, I don't know off the top of my head how many countries there are, but I always, we have a, um, sort of the owner the and the other team members who sort of drive Ally, we have a meeting every um, fortnight and I always get, I'm always very pleased to feel that I'm part of a global organisation then because those meetings really bring it alive because we have people joining the conversation from Berlin, Johannesburg, Los Angeles, you know, we feel we're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> through the miracle that is Skype you know we can do these things um, but we but we do have yeah we have membership uh, a growing membership in um, Australia India um, all over Europe um, well everywhere really yeah. uh, we ought we ought to actually have a little map that yeah, would be we fun have a we map, can, I love, <laughs> like the I love the map, vampire stuff. type map yes <laughs> and I think that's also exciting because it, it demonstrates that this is this is a global movement I mean the indie indie movement really is one and for, 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 yes. mu for music and film and other creative arts as well as books it's not yes. you know the, the, it really is a, a global thing and a cross industry thing uh, you know I think even the startup culture the fact that millennials would much rather start their own business than you know yeah. work in a big yeah. corporate I think this this movement will continue and um, yeah both of us you know hopefully be in the forefront with with ally and uh, <laughs> and in fact anyone yes. listening uh, yes. you know as well and uh, since we are talking about ally i will point people at the creative pen.com forward slash alliance which is uh, which is my <laughs> link um so tell us um where can people well first of all just tell us briefly uh, if people are interested in your flash fiction or short stories and your <laughs> writing where can people find you and your books uh online well, and your blog everything centrally on my author website about me and all all that i do with links going off in all directions which is authordebbyyoung.com and I've recently, funnily enough, just last month started up a book blog as well which is separate, um, which is debbyyoungsbookblog.com I have very obvious titles, <laughs> I like a simple life um, and uh, then people can also find me on the Ally website because I, um, I write uh, probably one or two blog posts a month on there but I'm, I'm on there every day looking at comments responding to comments and posting up the new posts because we have a new information post guest post every single day um, I'm on twitter at Debbie Young BN and the BN is for by name because my blog is called Young by Name <laughs> <laughs> and that's a subset of my author website. Well, look, Debbie, it's been fantastic to speak with you, and uh, you are a fountain of knowledge about many of these things. So I urge people to check out your website and that book and the Alliance of Independent Authors. So thanks for your time. Well, thank you very much. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to be part of your podcast. Thank you.